So thank you very much. It's very nice to be back in Canada. And uh, I see that um, your Prime Minister is visiting us at the minute, in fact. And I was reading this morning that he's practicing his Scottish accent. Uh, if you would like our Prime Minister in exchange, you're very welcome. I think we would certainly benefit from the swap. But anyway, uh, so what I want to do is to really put us into a global perspective and just reflect briefly on what we're all trying to achieve. Everyone working for, um, well, peace, order and good governance, as you say, in Canada, but basically a better world. And the agenda for doing that as we move forward from 2015 to 2030 is the Sustainable Development Goals. And I guess everybody is familiar with this picture. Uh, at conferences nowadays on international health, it is obligatory to show it at least once. And in particular, Sustainable Development Goal 3, uh, good health and well-being. But of course, health uh, is, uh, although it has its own goal, in fact, there are many of the other Sustainable Development Goals which contribute to it. Uh, and uh, it also has a whole range of, um, uh, there, there are other targets related to water and related to uh, sustainable development, related to education, uh, related to gender equality and so on that contribute to health. And the task of uh, the world, global public health community, is to how we can actually make sure that this all happens. It was so much easier in the past because when we were looking at the global health agenda in the period from 2000 to 2015, we had the Millennium Development Goals. And the Millennium Development Goals were actually relatively limited. In fact, they were extremely limited. Uh, so we had MDG4, which was about reducing the uh, deaths of children under five. And yes, that's, you know, in fairness, the, the world did actually make some considerable progress in doing that. Um, but it failed to achieve the target uh, of a two-thirds decline in the, uh, that was set out in the, in the goal. Now, why children under five? What is it that is special about children under five? Why was that included in the Millennium Development Goals? Well, primarily because the MDGs were driven by what was being measured. And if we looked across the world, one of the few things that was measured in health was under five mortality in every country of the world, almost every country of the world, through the demographic and health surveys. Now, these are undertaken about every five years. Um, obviously, in high income countries like Canada or the UK or Western Europe, you've got routine vital registration. But for the countries that don't have that, you need some other source of data. So the only thing that was actually measured, one of the few things was um, under five mortality. Another that was measured was uh, maternal mortality. Uh, and uh, again, um, progress was made. And uh, so by focusing resources, focusing efforts on these goals, uh, definitely things did happen. But again, uh, what was clear was that the world did not actually step up to the plate and do everything that it might have done. But the Millennium Development Goals were, as I say, very limited. There were also goals around HIV and TB and malaria, but there was really nothing about largely nothing about adult health, and in particular nothing about non-communicable diseases, uh, nothing about injuries, nothing about all the other things that affect um, people across the world. MDG6, I've mentioned HIV AIDS, um, I, that is one where again progress was made but the target was not achieved and the target was to halt and to begin to reverse the spread. Interestingly, in a few places, like in London now, there is some evidence that in fact the epidemic of HIV is halting uh, because of the widespread use of PrEP, but clearly we're way uh, far away from that in the rest of the world. So we have the Sustainable Development Goals, and the Sustainable Development Goals, there is a, a UN Statistical Commission interagency expert group that is trying to develop indicators uh, for this. Uh, to monitor progress. And the SDGs, as I said, go far beyond what we had. We'll look in, in a minute at what the health ones were. Uh, 230 indicators, 169 targets, and this is going to be an absolutely enormous effort uh, because, of course, there are huge data gaps in many countries. There are problems of comparability. There are parts of the world where we know almost nothing about what is happening. Uh, parts of the world like South Sudan, where perhaps a million people have fled their homes recently. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, who in the early uh, 2000s, uh, we had the, uh, the, problem, the, the wars, the 
the conflict around the Great Lakes with massive displacement of population, so very little idea as to what was actually happening. And of course the other issue that we need to be careful about as we look internationally is the problem of political interference in data capturing and reporting. Maybe not so much uh, an issue in this hemisphere, but certainly in the European region we have governments like uh, the government of Turkmenistan, uh, the government of Uzbekistan that actively suppress data and Kazakhstan on maternal mortality, on infant mortality, redefine birth, um, they, there is a WHO definition, but they redefine them to make them look better than they are. Uh, Turkmenistan covering up cases of plague and of course as you know in the recent debate about the election for a new uh, Director General of the World Health Organization uh, there were some serious questions being asked about the reporting of cholera from Ethiopia and in particular and now of course we've seen the effect of cholera spreading into Yemen. Uh, so a number of challenges in trying to understand what's going on. Well, of course, we do have a source of data, uh, the global burden of disease, and I guess everybody in the audience, I presume, is reasonably familiar with the global burden of disease, uh, at least in outline, and this has been a monumental exercise. It's epidemiology on an industrial scale. Uh, now, it does face major challenges, there are still huge gaps, so what it does is put into place ways of estimating data. Uh, if I tell you that one of the last papers that was submitted to The Lancet had 4,300 comments from the authors involved in it, uh, and that just gives you some idea of the scale of this work, the amount of work in looking at every country, looking at all the data, a, a massive effort of almost 5,000 people who are feeding data into the system, um, who are reviewing the data, working on the modeling, trying to make sense of it, and so on. And the question is whether or not you can actually do anything with these data uh, to try to make sense. Uh, so what was done in terms of looking at the sustainable development goals, before I go on to the particular, the, the more specific health measures, um, was uh, an attempt to look at 33 health-related indicators uh, of, of the sustainable development goals for 188 countries. There are 193 countries in the World Health Organization. Uh, but there are a number that are uh, tiny, uh, and uh, like Monaco, for example, and Nauru and some of the Pacific Islands. Uh, so it included basically all the countries of the world, apart from the ones that are smaller than a, a small village somewhere in northern Ontario, um, which there are a few. And it attempted uh, for each of these to develop a scale from naught, which was the worst observed value at any time in the world uh, between 1990 and 2015, and 100 to the uh, best observed, uh, the, the best that could be seen anywhere. And it generated a couple of indices. So what it did was, the first thing it did was to say, well, let's look at the sustainable development goals, and I'll give you some examples in a minute, and we'll create an overall index of progress towards the health-related sustainable development goals. But then let's divide them up and divide them up into those ones that were covered by the Millennium Development Goals because we would expect that the ones covered by the Millennium Development Goals might have done better in the period up to 2015 because that was where the attention was being focused. And then the other ones which were not included in the Millennium Development Goals. Because we always know that if you're measuring something, if you're reporting on it, you will devote attention to it. And this was always the problem with the Millennium Development Goals. Non-communicable diseases, injuries were just not there. And it was very difficult to get any political attention to them. So just a, a few examples, and, and these are indicators. They're not comprehensive measures. They're not capturing everything. But if one of the goals, the goal one, end poverty in all its forms everywhere and has a particular target um, which is related to health, by 2030 build the resilience of the poor in those in vulnerable situations and reduce their exposure and vulnerability to climate-related extreme events and other economic, social, economic, environmental shocks and disasters. So therefore, if you have a measure uh, which looks at age-standardized death rate due to exposure of the forces of nature, uh, so flooding and uh, things like that, uh, uh, then you're beginning to get an indicator. Of course, there are many, many other deaths that would be captured in that goal, but at least it indicates the direction of uh, travel. 
end hunger, achieve food security and improve nutrition, uh, sustainable goal two, and there the prevalence of stunting and the prevalence of wasting in children. It's an indicator, not perfect, it's an indicator, doesn't capture everything. And again, uh, gender empowerment, um, age standardized prevalence of intimate partner violence, difficult to measure, of course, um, in, um, in women aged 15 and above. Uh, so um, this is what we get when we look at the world. And essentially what we're saying here is, if you're green, you're doing well, and if you're red, you're doing badly. Uh, so the green countries, well done Canada, exactly where you would expect to be. Uh, the US, well done, you wouldn't necessarily expect it to be quite so high, but it is. We'll look in more detail at your southern neighbour later in this talk. Uh, Australia, Western Europe, although not all of, um, not all of the European Union, uh, for example, Poland could perhaps do a little bit better. And the countries that are not doing well are exactly where you'd expect them. Most of sub-Saharan Africa, for example. Uh, countries like Afghanistan, Nepal, Bangladesh actually, uh, not doing as well as it, it, uh, you might hope that it would do. So you can see that you can begin to get a composite measure. Um, the problem then is, of course, um, what would you um, reasonably expect? Because you cannot re really expect a country which has got no resources, has no people, has no money, to be able to achieve the same as a country like Canada. I mean, it would be great if it could, but clearly there are huge obstacles in the way. Um, now, how do we measure what a country can do? How do we measure its capacity? Well, there are lots of ways of doing it. GDP per capita is probably the most widely used. Lots of limitations to that. It simply <coughs> reflects the amount of money moving around in the economy. And as Robert Kennedy famously said, it measures everything but that which makes life worthwhile. In other words, uh, for example, a large oil spill will increase the GDP because you spent money cleaning it up. But, you know, it, there it is. Human Development Index, which brings in measures of uh, social measures and demographic measures life, like life expectancy and education. The Sustainable Development Index, which adds in carbon in emissions to get an index of sustainability. So what the Global Burden of Disease team did was to get a, an index of where countries might be able, or what they might be able to achieve, was to create a socio-demographic index. And that was a combination of income, education, and fertility, on the basis that uh, by reducing fertility was an indicator of development in its own right, for lots of reasons, partly because, of course, whenever families know that their children will survive, they do tend to have fewer children. So that was an attempt to try and get some sort of a frontier analysis. And um, what, what they, they found was actually um, the socio-demographic index explained a lot of the variation in the progress that was made towards the sustainable development goals. Um, it was particularly um, good at explaining the bits of the social the sustainable development goals that were the Millennium Development Goals. So if you only took out that subset of indicators that focused on under five mortality, maternal mortality, HIV, and so on, it did particularly well. Um, it um, also explained quite a lot of the measure overall. It was less good at measuring the non-Millennium Development Goal bits, but generally it uh, explained quite a lot of the variation. And you could divide the world up and you would, as you would expect, the countries up at the top um, were the Western Europe, North American ones, uh, the high income countries down at the bottom, you had Sub-Saharan Africa. But it didn't explain all, so even there you've got quite a lot of scatter around the, um, the, the uh, line, the, um, the trend line. What this picture does is to show you where countries are compared to where they should be. And it's the observed minus the expected. So again, if a country is in blue, it's doing well. It's doing much better than it should do, given its level of income and education and fertility. So countries that are doing well there, um, Spain, Portugal, Morocco, in fact, Jordan, um, the European countries are doing not too badly. Canada's doing just about right. I mean, nothing wrong. You're doing as you would expect to do. Uh, but the United States is doing rather less well than you would expect it to um, for all sorts of reasons. The former Soviet Union, countries there which we mentioned, which um, uh, Greg mentioned earlier, countries that do have resources, in fact Russia has lots of resources, it has lots of oil, it's got lots of gas, but it's doing significantly worse, the, uh, the United Arab Emirates, South Africa, all doing worse than they should be.
China doing a bit better, uh, India doing worse. And again, we know that this is one of the recurring themes looking at what's happening in Asia. China often moving ahead and India uh, failing to healthcare being a, a one significant part of that. So this gives us some indication of how countries are doing in the sustainable development goals overall. Uh, but it, um, uh, then uh, when we, we begin to look in a bit more detail, um, this is uh, an indicator of the progress that's been made. So along the uh, x-axis, you've got the, uh, the, the score and the sustainable development goals in 2000. And along the y-axis, you've got where they were in 2015. So the further you are above the line, the more progress you have made. Now, of course, some countries have actually done worse. Chile, not altogether clear why Chile has, but it's just sort of on the line, so it's probably within the limit of uncertainty. Libya, Syria, hardly surprising. Exactly what you would expect. But there are some interesting outliers there. Colombia, Bhutan, Timor-Leste, Taiwan. Canada, doing a bit better than would be expected, uh, but uh, making some progress. And um, some that are making no progress at all, like Brunei, despite lots of money from the oil, and uh, South Sudan, of course, racked by war. Now, when we look to try to understand why countries are doing um, well or badly, the first obvious thing, and again, staying with Canada, the Ottawa Charter, one of the first fundamental preconditions for health is peace. And uh, if I see Solly Benatar, who has written lots about, uh, again, uh, global governance and, and, and uh, the, the importance of, of peace and, and the importance of uh, all the things that go with that. Uh, shelter, education, food, and all these other things. But war clearly is a major determinant of failing to make progress. So the countries that are conflict affected are exactly where you would expect them to be. That is not at all surprising. But what do we find when we look at the other ones, the ones that have made more progress than other countries in their group? And in the study, we looked at a number of countries which were the best performers at each quintile of the Sustainable Development Goals. So in the low-income countries, Timor-Leste doing better than expected, Tajikistan, Colombia as a middle-income country, Taiwan, a middle-high-income country, and Iceland. And what do we learn? Well, Timor-Leste, um, Huge amount of development assistance, of course, from Australia, particularly New Zealand, largely as a consequence of its escaping, well, from the occupation by Indonesia uh, and, it, uh, and the drive by the international community to create a state out of something that really wasn't a state at all. Um, and I guess you all know that Timor-Leste was originally a Portuguese colony, was occupied by Indonesia in the period after the Portuguese Revolution. Um, there was essentially a genocide there and uh, there were huge problems and then when it became independent it had enormous challenges to overcome. But healthcare reform was there. It had a lot of external support from many Western countries. Um, uh, fi uh, and with um, financing, sustainable financing, the Ministry of Health had rolled out a basic health services package, really pushing for universal health coverage. Now, what happens when you look at the bits of the sustainable development goals? Good in terms of um, measures of universal health coverage. It made a lot of progress with skilled birth attendance, um, modern contraception, reducing under five and neonatal mortality and childhood stunting, sanitation, and clearly mortality from war and conflict, but it had problems. And again, what we're seeing in many countries is this epidemiological transition, still seeing children with stunting, but also seeing a growing uh, problem of childhood obesity. Uh, after conflicts come in, the international tobacco companies move very quickly, and you have the problems of smoking and similarly with alcohol. So these give some clues as to what countries had done to achieve things. Tajikistan, again emerging from a civil war, um, and um, it focused in particular malaria uh, elimination. It had many problems. Tajikistan is in the WHO European region, but only by accident. It's there because it was a republic of the Soviet Union. It is in every other, uh, in, in all appearances, like Afghanistan, which lies across the border. It's another one of these artificial countries. It's divided into four by mountain ranges, and uh, nobody would ever have actually created a country like that, except that they were lines drawn on a map by Stalin in the 1920s. So it's had a lot to put up with, a lot to overcome. 
um, still struggling to, with the concept of democracy. But it has made progress in childhood mortality and stunting. Again, a lot of international development assistance, um, reducing NCD mortality, violence, improving hygiene, but again, seeing problems of the emerging uh, childhood obesity. Colombia, we look in the middle of the range, and uh, Colombia has actually done a lot in terms of its expansion of health insurance. I'm not sure, maybe some of you here work in Colombia. We, we do, in fact, in the meeting I have in, in um, Niagara uh, later this week, uh, we're uh, discussing a cluster randomized control trial of hypertension management we're doing in Colombia and Malaysia. And uh, the uh, health system reforms have made a, a, a huge difference, but there are still problems. There are still a lot of gaps. We have done work looking at the experience of patients as with hypertension as they understand the health system, that, as they see it, as they try to navigate uh, through it. Um, problems with alcohol consumption, still problems with hep B. But you can see lots of areas where they really have made progress. And here we're beginning to see we're beginning to see more of a public health response because with the other bits, it was universal health coverage, getting very basic services out. Taiwan, like Korea, uh, like a number of countries in East Asia, uh, introduced a uh, universal health coverage in the 1990s. It has a very active public health program. The Public Health Bureau in Taipei, some of you might know um, some of the uh, people who work there, uh, has really been in the forefront against tobacco, alcohol, physical activity, but also has implemented national health insurance. This is a paper that we published a few years ago where we looked at the impact of that on amenable mortality, something we'll come back to later. And you can see that by expanding coverage of health care, they made a real difference in terms of mortality. But even at the very top, even some of the healthiest countries in the world can still do better. Iceland, a country where everything works, despite the fact that it's winter for about 10 months of the year, uh, with the highest level of social capital you will ever see anywhere. Because if you go there, if you fly on the plane from London or from uh, Copenhagen, everybody on the plane will be greeting each other with the, the bless, the word that uh, they say in, in Icelandic, because actually everybody in the plane knows one another, including the pilot and the crew. Uh, it has a very small population, um, a very high level. They actually had a murder recently, uh, which is almost exceptional. The murder was committed by two uh, Greenlandic fishermen. Uh, they weren't uh, Icelandic who committed the murder, uh, but that, that is pretty exceptional there. Uh, and it does extremely well in all sorts of ways. Um, but again, um, it has problems with alcohol, with uh, obesity. But the, the point is that here is a country that's doing exceptionally well in healthcare. But let's come back to the sustainable development goals. Oops. Uh, yeah. Uh, and let's, uh, le le sorry, let's come back to healthcare. Because what we've seen as we look at the countries is they've made progress in the sustainable development goals in terms of public health interventions, maybe not as good as they might have done, and they've made progress in terms of expanding healthcare. But can we really focus down now on healthcare? And we actually do need to do that because if we look at the SDG targets, well, first of all, there's an awful lot of them. So these are only the health ones. So you can see the same things that we had in the MDGs, maternal mortality, childhood mortality, newborn mortality, neonatal mortality, epidemics of AIDS, TB, malaria, neglected tropical diseases are now in there. They weren't there before. But now we've got non-communicable diseases coming in. And this was one of the major criticisms of the Millennium Development Goals. NCDs were coming in. Premature mortality. Now, there still is a big argument raging over premature mortality under the age of 75. A number of us have been campaigning and saying, well, there are people over 75 who should be considered as well. Um, some of them, I suspect, in this audience. And um, you will be pleased to know that we're not neglecting your interests. Um, Martin Prince and Shai Ibrahim and uh, Peter Lloyd Sherlock have been mounting a campaign to look at the health of older people um, as people like me get progressively towards that age. Of course, it's uh, not entirely altruism. There's a degree of self-interest. Um, narcotics, alcohol, substance abuse, road traffic accidents neglected for a long time, sexual and reproductive health. Well, that was sort of always there. But then we have this other goal, achieve universal health coverage including financial risk protection, because of course, remember, one of the main arguments for universal health coverage is to pre prevent catastrophic expenditure. Um, access to quality essential health services, um, essential medicines and vaccines for all. And then there's a whole series of others about pharmaceuticals and the health workforce and so on. So here we have a target 
for universal health coverage and we need to be able to measure it because if we can't actually capture it in any way then what are we going to do? Now we could of course say well you're all familiar with the the cube of universal health coverage the breadth of services that are included the percentage of the population the degree of coverage and the amount of, of cost sharing um, but that's fine in terms of sort of inputs we need to actually find out what is what these services are actually delivering. There's no point in spending a huge amount of money if it's not actually helping anybody. And as we all know from the history of development, particularly in Africa, uh, the classic examples of spending 80% or, or maybe of the, the government's health budget on a large teaching hospital and not reaching out any further. We need to have some measure of, um, actually, of the actual achievements. So uh, this came about, um, how this happened was a discussion that Chris Murray from uh, the University of Washington and myself and Ellen Nolte had about how we would develop some work that we'd done a long time ago. This was work that was developed way back in the 1970s by somebody called Rutstein, who, but actually it goes even further back to Florence Nightingale. Because Florence Nightingale was known as a pioneer of nursing but probably less well known as a pioneer of medical statistics. And she was a leading authority in her time in advancing ideas in, in medical statistics. And one of the things she showed was that in the Crimean War, being admitted to hospital significantly increased your chances of dying, not of recovering, of dying. Hospitals were very dangerous places. Now, of course, we've known that hospitals have been dangerous for a long time. Um, Richard Asher, a physician in London, uh, the father of Jane Asher, the actress, um, wrote a, a well-known book called The Dangers of Going to Bed, in which he pointed out that putting people in bed for long periods of time was not necessarily good for their health. But the idea here is that healthcare really should make people better. Because if we're paying for healthcare, if you're paying for it through your taxes and people are paying through insurance contributions, you would reasonably have an expectation that that healthcare will make you better rather than kill you. So what we tried to do was to work out conditions, identify conditions where healthcare really could make a difference. And initial, the initial work was based in expert judgment and subsequently we've done lots of systematic reviews. Uh, we'll look at some of the challenges in a minute of, of actually doing this. The next problem is to decide an upper age limit and this is particularly difficult um, because everybody has to die from something sometime. And Arguably, you know, you might say, well, people can uh, be, we can now do a huge amount to reduce mortality from myocardial infarction. Can you do it at the age of 105? Maybe. Uh, but should you consider those deaths as truly amenable? Interestingly, in the Netherlands, there is evidence that mortality from acute myocardial infarction over the last 20 years has fallen at every year of life up to 100 up to and including 100. So clearly it is making a difference, but you've got to come up with some um, uh, upper limit. And another reason why you need some sort of an upper limit is purely practical, because the difficulty is that, as we know from Stuart Mercer's work and from others, by the time you get even to the age of about 65, about half of the population will have two comorbid conditions. And as you get older, they will have multiple comorbid conditions. And the real difficulty is working out what they died from. And in our work, where we've been doing work in particularly looking at alcohol-related mortality, even when you do autopsies, deciding which cause of death to put down can really be quite challenging. Obviously, if you walk in front of a bus, it's dead easy, but for somebody with four or five different chronic conditions, it can be really, really difficult. You know they're dead, you know they've got the conditions, but what actually killed them? Um, so there are problems. Uh, so initially the work by Rutstein started off with an upper age limit of 65, uh, but as I've said, that age limit progressively increased largely because the people who were writing about it were getting older and they realized that 65 was maybe a little bit ungenerous uh, and uh, to write off themselves and all of their friends prematurely seemed probably not, not in their own best interests because uh, you, know, you want to, you want to at least have some self-interest. There were a few exceptions in the initial list, diabetes under the age of 50. Um, because of the problems of coding, childhood leukemia was deemed amenable to more, uh, whereas uh, adult morta the chronic uh, lymphatic leukemias and myeloid leukemias in older ages were not. 
Uh, so that was the initial list. Um, just a few of the examples of what was included. Things that were pretty obvious, TB, measles, uh, non-melanoma skin cancer, breast cancer, uh, pneumonias, influenzas, peptic ulcer, cholecystitis, maternal deaths. And uh, there's nothing particularly controversial there. I think you would expect that healthcare could make a difference in all of those. The problem is attribution, and this is where it really gets difficult. What is actually causing death rates to fall from these conditions? Because we know that amenable, these amenable deaths have fallen often at a faster rate than other causes of death. Now, wouldn't it be nice if in each case you had a magic bullet, something came in that really made a difference, like AZT and HIV, which did, TB. Um, and here uh, is the example of uh, looking at the age-specific death rates um, from tuberculosis in England and Wales um, from the 19, late 1940s and mid-1940s to the 1950s. And year on year, the death rate fell after the introduction of streptomycin. I mean, this was incredible, although not at older ages. It was at younger ages, but there you were seeing this phenomenal decline year on year, really remarkably dramatic. But it is very, very, very rare to find things like that. And the problem is, of course, that you've got, a progressive, you've, uh, you've got progressive gains in the effectiveness of, of treatments. People just get better doing it. Uh, people know, are, are more experienced in, in uh, how to conduct uh, interventions. You get rollout, progressive rollout. Uh, one of the papers that we're looking at at the minute, we have, we have under review at the minute, is looking at the expansion of piece of um, percutaneous coronary interventions in Russia, um, which has been a remarkable success in spreading out coverage to a very, uh, very um, low population density country. And of course, we've been looking at your experiences in Canada and experiences in Australia as well. But simply rolling it out, getting it to people. And the latest study we've uh, done shows that even now, uh, there's still about 30% of the Russian population that realistically will never be within an hour's travel distance of a, of a, a center that is able to, to do that. But, you know, that, that's part of um, what's been happening. Expansion of indications. Treatments are brought in and they're applied to new things that weren't originally intended. But the real difficulty is trying to make this link. We can say all of these things are happening. But when we try to say how much of the improvement was due to a particular thing, then we have problems because r randomized controlled trials typically compare innovation with the best existing treatment, not with no treatment. Randomized controlled trials are undertaken on highly selected subjects by highly sub uh, selected practitioners in highly selected centers like some of the ones around here. They're not often carried out in the small rural hospitals where conditions may be very different. Very few, and this is a point that people who are concerned about the evidence on pharmaceutical effectiveness keep pointing out, very few have mortality as an outcome. One of the big debates about statins, even debates about clearance of hepatitis C that's been going on recently, uh, the very widespread use of surrogate outcomes. Um, looking at HbA1c as a measure of diabetes control, it's fine as a measure of diabetes control. Does that translate into reduced mortality against diabetes? And of course, variable lags between the introduction of an innovation and a reduction in mortality. So it's really, really difficult to say what part of an in, a new in, innovation made a difference in mortality. We can say that deaths from particular conditions where we now have healthcare did actually decline, but what was actually driving it? This is just an example of the reduction in mortality from some surgical conditions. It's old data um, from 1979 to 2000. And you're seeing, we can see there that for prostatic hyperplasia, the, the death rate fell by about 90%. For gallstones, it fell by about 40%. Now, obviously, it's gone a lot further after that. But there was no, and appendicitis, a 50% reduction in mortality. Now, there was no major intervention in the treatment of appendicitis in that period. People have known how to take an appendix out since, well, King Edward VII, as I recall, had it te one taken out about 19, oh, was he Prince of Wales at the time? Maybe even before the turn of the 20th century. Uh, so, uh, and the, the technique hasn't changed. The actual process of removing an appendix hasn't changed, but there was still a vast uh, reduction in mortality. Safer anesthesia, intravenous anesthesia, intravenous anesthesia, anesthetics rather than inhalational ones, uh, better post-operative care. Nothing in particular, there was no one thing that was doing this, but taken together, 
And then another study which looks at trauma care in the United Kingdom. Again, old data, but it makes the point nicely. There was a uh, significant improvement in the odds of survival. And if this was brought up to date, it would be really dramatically better. Uh, the point that has been made in the recent um, viola episodes of violence in London um, where, as you know, we've had a number of, of tragedies uh, that have been caused by extremists on different types, uh, white supremacists and Islamists, um, where the people who have been injured in these, if they get to hospital, they virtually, in fact, they all survive. So anybody that isn't actually dead before they get paramedics getting to them now has a very, very high probability of survival. And what has driven that? Well, um, it's no one thing. Um, more patients seen by uh, teamwork, senior doctors present, uh, more staff with advanced life support training, a coordination, audit, a whole series of things. So there's nothing that's very specific. And then, of course, coverage and quality. Now, I always do like this slide because um, this um, looks at your southern neighbour. And this is where we looked at amenable mortality uh, by race and by state in the United States. Now, of course, not surprisingly, there are differences. You would expect there to be differences in outcomes between Vermont and Mississippi, and you see that. Uh, but what you also see is there's almost a complete gap between black and white, and that, as we, in other work that we've done, is largely due to access to care. Uh, as has been pointed out on a number of occasions, uh, if you look at the states that refused to take federal money to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act and map them onto the Confederacy of, of the Civil War, uh, with the exception of, I think, Tennessee, they map exactly. The states that were in the Confederacy in the Civil War uh, did not take the federal money to expand Medicaid. Um, and, um, th that, and other work that we have done has looked at state political culture. This is all about race, I mean, absolutely fundamentally about race. But that is about coverage uh, and access to care. Uh, I always like to put this one in because uh, it does show that if you are actually African American, your outcome is by far the best in Hawaii and it is by far the worst in the District of Columbia. Uh, so uh, I'm delighted that the Obamas actually survived their eight years in Washington. Uh, you can see that that move was not necessarily the best of moves that they might have made for their health, but uh, anyway, they, they, uh, they maybe had access to a different type of care. So the challenges that we have as we try, we can then say, well, what do we do about looking at this on a global basis? Um, we look at, we can try to um, see, we, we, the work that's been done in amenable mortality has virtually all been done in high income countries. It's been done in the US, the Commonwealth Fund use our methodology uh, in, their, in their state, um, you know, holding up a mirror to the states. OECD now use it. Uh, the British government use it, uh, and, um, and so on. But the problem is, of course, the rest of the world. And the difficulty there is getting any decent data. There are problems of incomplete and absent registration, so-called garbage codes, which are codes that don't really mean very much, uh, like dying from old age and things like that. But there's another problem, because in all of the work that we did, we never really adjusted for underlying risk factors. We just said, well, basically, people should not die at all from these conditions. But in fairness, it is easier to reduce the death rate from a condition if you actually uh, have a lower risk factor burden to begin with. So it's always going to be easier to reduce the death rate from ischemic heart disease in Spain than it is, for example, in Russia. I mean, that's just natural because there's so much less ischemic heart disease. So you need to uh, do something about that. And then the challenge of trying to capture variations within countries. So the Healthcare Access and Quality Index, this is the main thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, but uh, so what we, we did, uh, what was done in, in the work with the uh, colleagues in Seattle was to take uh, 33 causes of death uh, that we had identified as amenable to healthcare and to map them onto the categories that were used in the global burden of disease. Um, there were a couple that were not included because they just didn't map on easily into the high level, uh, the hi the, the high -level targets and diphtheria and tetanus because of their burden worldwide. Um, they were taken separately. We'd group them together because in high income countries there are hardly any of them. Um, but if you're looking on a global basis, they're, they're separate. And um, the GBD team then took account of the problems with cause of death certification. Now, of course, they have this vast data set with vital registration, with sentinel surveillance, um, with verbal autopsy data, with um, census data, with every kind of data you could imagine. 
and they also have a means of estimating data where they don't have it by looking at other predictors. Lots of questions about that and we could talk for hours about the estimation processes in the global burden of disease and there are limitations to the data but they do have data and um, they have ways of uh, adjusting for misclassification and particularly garbage codes. But this is where the real breakthrough came because they were able with their massive computing power in a way that we never could have done was to take account of the risk factors to try to take out the local risk factors uh, the levels of lipids the level of smoking the level of whatever and take out the national figures and then put back in the global figures for that so in effect you were risk standardizing for the whole world so every country was being given a value which was adjusted for the, the level of risk factors. And then they used principal components analysis to create a single measure. And again, what they did was to say the highest value for any country in the world, any country in the world with a population of um, over a million, because clearly you could get fluctuations in the smaller ones. But for, if you got a, a value on a particular measure that was the, the highest anywhere, that was the, the maximum, that was 100. And the worst that anybody had anywhere during that time was zero. And then you scale everything in between. And then they calculate, they had a look at, well, when we get this index, um, does the index actually correlate with other measures of inputs into healthcare. And yeah, it did actually work quite well. Health expenditure per capita, uh, uh, R of uh, 0.88, um, an index of other interventions, access to antenatal care and things like that, 0.83, um, physicians, nurses, health, human resources for health, 0.77. So it, it was doing pretty well. And we wouldn't expect it to those to predict all of the, the variation. If they did, there would be no point in even developing this index. Clearly, there has to be some fluctuation. But the next question is, rather like with the sustainable development goals, it's not just how well countries are doing, but how well might countries do? What can we reasonably expect them to do? And again, a frontier was developed using the same so sociodemographic index. And based on the socio-demographic index, the highest value of any country um, with that level of socio-demographic score was set as the frontier. If that country could do it, every country should uh, theoretic uh, theoretically be able to do it. Now, what do we get when we look at this? Well, you, as you would expect, um, the countries that are up at the top, the high-income countries, there's Canada doing well, Sweden doing particularly well, Western Europe doing particularly well, Portugal not doing so well. Australia doing very well, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, India not doing well, Mongolia, China doing better than India. Uh, again, it's the green good, red bad. West Africa doing particularly, uh, uh, and much of Sub-Saharan and Africa doing um, very uh, badly. So that's what it was in 1990, but what about, uh, what did we find after 1990? Well, when you looked at the progress that was made, almost all countries actually did improve, but, and this is perhaps not that unexpected, because if healthcare really is making a difference, those countries that can actually take full advantage of that, that can afford it, that have health workers to deliver it, that have money to buy drugs and to distribute them, those countries will move ahead even more quickly. And that's exactly what happened. So the gap between the best and the worst performers widened over the period from 1990 to 2015. As I say, most countries did do well, um, 167 out of 195 territories uh, saw a statistically significant increases and most of the rest showed at least no change or, or some uh, maybe not significant increase. Big gains, the countries that were doing well, South Korea, Turkey, Peru, China and the Maldives. The reasons why countries were doing well, the high income countries were making big inroads into cancer. And we see that in a number of countries, in particular breast cancer mortality has fallen very dramatically in many countries, uh, one of the biggest killers among women. Um, and um, that still not fully explained. Screening probably does play some role, but I know it's controversial. But treatment definitely plays a role as well. Uh, and in particular, the use of thing, uh, drugs like tamoxifen. Middle income countries, well, people were beginning to get on dialysis. People were getting control of their hypertension. Hypertension management has been a huge uh, gain worldwide. Just getting simple hypertensive, antihypertensives to people. 
better control of diabetes uh, because uh, until, uh, in fact, even now there are large parts of Africa where children with type 1 diabetes just waste away and die in the course of 18 months. And often it's indistinguishable from untreated HIV. The only difference is that people might spot the ants following the sugar in the trail of urine at the latrine. That's the way you diagnose it in some parts of rural Mozambique, unfortunately. Um, uh, but there's a huge effort by particularly the Life for a Child program of the International Diabetes Federation to get insulin to these children, a problem when they get to adulthood. Diarrheal diseases, oral rehydration therapy, um, lower respiratory infections, immunization has made a huge difference. And that's all along the lines of what you'd expect. So there we are, the countries, if we look at the, the bottom, the X-axis 1990, the Y-axis uh, is uh, 2015, Almost everybody's done better, and the, the, uh, there are error bars associated with that. But you see there South Korea, Turkey, China, China and Peru, and, and uh, Maldives, as I've already mentioned. So this is the picture by 2015. Everybody's doing better. Almost everybody's doing better. Canada, right up there at the top. Western Europe, right up there at the top. Portugal, still lagging a bit. Poland, still lagging a bit. Sub-Saharan Africa, actually doing somewhat better in, in, in some parts. It's not all a deep red. Large parts of it all are, but not everywhere is. Tucked in there you can see countries doing a bit better like Rwanda. Ethiopia, uh, we'll come back to that later, doing a little bit better. South Africa, uh, Latin America doing better. Australia also right up at the top. So significant progress. Now what you can also do is of course then take the data from the uh, index and you can look at how different conditions are. Now it was impossible to get this onto a slide that would be readable, so do forgive me. But what this basically does is it's got along the top, the, um, the first column is the index itself and countries are ranked in terms of their score in the index. So I've taken the ones right up at the top, Andorra, Iceland, Switzerland, Sweden, and the one with the red uh, around it is Canada. So yeah, pretty good. You know, could do better, but pretty good. So you're below Belgium and France, you're above Slovenia, Greece and Germany and Singapore and New Zealand. Uh, but right up at the top, Andorra, Iceland, Switzerland. So what do you do well in? Well, you're doing very well in TB, good. Um, although, as you know, there are, with First Nation communities, there's still a problem there anyway. Uh, but um, you're doing well in terms of um, upper respiratory infections and vaccine-preventable diseases, but maybe not so well in lower respiratory infections. You could do a little bit better there. Um, Non-melanoma skin cancer, not as good as other countries are doing. Uh, some of the others are leukemia, Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, but generally pretty well. So Canada, you know, give yourself a round of applause. Uh, but you uh, are uh, doing uh, very well in terms of progress on that. But then we look right down at the bottom, and at the bottom reading from the, the, the bottom upwards, Central African Republic, well, as you know, Central African Republic is in the midst of a civil war, is just a completely desperate situation. Afghanistan, what, what can I say? Somalia, the same. Guinea-Bissau, Chad, um, again, conflict-affected countries. Eritrea, uh, Eritrea, a country whose president says that if anybody thinks they believe or has any belief in democracy, they can believe in it in the next world uh, because it's clearly not going to appear in his own country and where he has mass conscription of effectively slave labor, which explains some of the reasons why so many Eritreans are fleeing the country. Haiti, South Sudan, DRC and, and others. And again, you can begin to look at where countries are doing particularly badly. And some of them, obviously, the infectious diseases, Central African Republic, a score of only 11 on tuberculosis, one of the lowest that you see anywhere, right down at the bottom in terms of neonatal disorders and so on. So what is possible? Well, this is the frontier analysis, and um, these are the countries, the red or the pink are um, countries in 2015, the greens are uh, countries in, in uh, 1990. And um, some of the countries are above the frontier because they're very small. As I said, this is only, the frontier is derived by looking at only countries of one million population and above. What did we find? Well, as the sustainable, as the um, sociodemographic index goes up, so does the index. Overall, the gap between the index and the frontier narrowed over time. And some countries did really well. Some countries did much better than expected, given their level of sociodemographic uh, develop or social development. Burundi, Rwanda, Rwanda, the poster child uh, post genocide in Africa. Now, there are many questions about Paul Kagame, the president's reputation on human rights, which many of you will be familiar with. 
but he has been the beneficiary of a vast amount of international development assistance. Um, one of our former Prime Ministers, Tony Blair, spends a lot of time there. And, um, and of course, uh, particularly, and this is an issue that Canada, different parts of Canada might reflect on, it is a country that moved from being Francophone to Anglophone, um, which brought it very substantial rewards in the international development community. So I'm not, not sure if I would maybe praise it quite so much if I was giving this talk in Montreal. And um, Peru, Turkey, Turkey, a country that actually until Erdogan um, really made health part of its image. It was a bit like, you know, what do you associate, word association games, and you, you think about Canada, Maple Leaf, Universal Health Care, you know, the Canadian, Canada Health Act is one of the things that identifies Canada, that Canada rightly is pr most proud of in the international arena. Turkey, Thailand, all countries that have actually prioritized health, Uruguay, where health is actually part of foreign policy in a way they've said, we're making health a real priority. Uh, and Rwanda, Turkey, um, were countries that, that did that. South Korea, an economic miracle, but really invested in health after the, uh, the downfall of the, the military government. And that was part of the legitimization of the park, uh, the original park government. But in some places, the gap widened. Some countries actually did less well than they should have given their overall level of development. Many bits of sub-Saharan Africa are beyond Rwanda and Burundi. Iraq, unsurprisingly, Pakistan and Honduras. Uh, Honduras afflicted with conflict. Well, what about uh, how, uh, how, just let's a couple, look at a couple of examples. Um, so here we have in the blue line, we've got Canada. And as you can see, Canada has moved substantially up uh, in the, uh, the, the, the score has uh, moved, oops, somehow or other, this is just, my screen has just gone blank. Ah, there it is. Uh, so Canada has, um, has done well. The United States has done well, but it hasn't done as well. And if you look at the gap between the frontier, where it could be with its socio-demographic index and where it is, um, well, the United States um, has uh, narrowed the gap a little bit, but nothing like as much as Canada has narrowed the gap. Canada has improved, and it has improved more than would be expected given its overall level of development. In South Asia, two countries that contrast markedly, and this is particularly ironic given that until the early 1970s, they were actually the same country, East and West Pakistan. Uh, and uh, you can see that Pakistan, which way back in 1990 was um, doing better than Bangladesh, has really made almost no progress at all, and is now way behind Bangladesh, despite Bangladesh having enormous problems, climatic problems, population problems, huge challenges in all sorts of ways. But as you know, in Pakistan, health has been right at the bottom of the development agenda. And for a while, it actually had abolished its Ministry of Health. In Africa, we can see, again, two countries, one starting far below the, the, the other, Ethiopia, some of you will be old enough to remember the famine in Ethiopia in the 1980s. This was a disaster uh, on a monumental scale, and it brought about a huge response, of just a complete paradigm shift in how development assistance was viewed in the West, with Bob Geldorf and others um, setting up Live Aid. But look at the progress that Ethiopia has done compared to the very limited pr progress in Kenya. Now, there's much more to this, because in Kenya, Kenya has always had problems. Another comparison I could have done is with Tanzania. And this takes us into the issue of divided countries, ethnically, linguistically, religiously, racially divided countries. The same issue we saw in the United States, the southern states were the, the higher the proportion of African Americans in the population, the less generous is welfare, the less generous is Medicaid and so on. <coughs> in Kenya, there has never been any attempt to create a unified nation. The Kikuyu, uh, grouping has always been dominant, and as was said when President Obama became president of the US, it is easier for somebody from the Lao tribe, as his father was, to become president of the United States than to become president of Kenya. In contrast, in Tanzania, uh, Julius Nyeri, the post-independence president, really worked on building a unified state, even though you had the same divisions. You have huge divisions in Ethiopia too. The Tigrayans are still the very dominant group, but they have created a sense of an Ethiopian identity. 
perhaps made a bit easier by having lost Eritrea, of course, um, that may be a factor too. And of course, benefiting hugely from massive international development assistance because Ethiopia is fighting a proxy war for the West against Islamists in Somalia. In Southeast Asia, uh, again two countries uh, that, uh, that start, started off relatively close, uh, but Thailand has moved ahead of Vietnam and the, the gap has widened um, for Vietnam, widened quite considerably. But Thailand introduced universal health coverage, some questions at the minute about what's happening, but again um, seen as a poster child and the Thai government has promoted its achievements in health. It has the Prince Mahidol Award. It, um, portrays itself in the world like Turkey does, like Uruguay. Here are places where health is really taken. It's important. It's a form of soft power in the international arena. So we can now look up, coming right up to date, 2015, where are the gaps? Well, um, Canada's doing well, but could do better in terms of the gap of what it could achieve. Western Europe is doing pretty well. There are some countries in Africa that are actually doing quite well. That's, of course, partly because they have such a low level of development, Mali and Niger. Turkey, again, doing well. Australia, China doing well. India, not doing well. And South Africa, definitely not doing well. And, of course, as many of you know, and Sully in particular, the, the, the failure to maximise on the hope and the optimism of the Mandela period, uh, although progress is now being made. Well, conscious of time, and I know we want to have some questions, but I might just throw in just some of the other things that we have learned from looking at some of these countries. And interestingly, although we did this study before we had the Health and Quality Index, um, we were looking for countries that seemed, on the basis of other evidence, to be performing better than expected. And it was an update of a very early project, uh, 20, nearly 30 years ago now, the classic one that many of you will be familiar with, which looked at countries that seem to be achieving good health at low cost, Kerala in India, China, Costa Rica. Costa Rica, where universal health coverage came in in the 1930s, in fact, and um, when they abolished their army and spent the money on health instead in Sri Lanka. Um, and what that report found was that political commitment to health was important, strong societal values of equity, political participation, high level investment in primary care and female um, emancipation and, and, and education and intersectoral linkages. So we looked, uh, bringing it right up to date, we looked at a number of other countries. And the countries we looked at were Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Kyrgyzstan, Tamil Nadu and Thailand, some of which you've already heard about. And we looked at other measures, but essentially these were all countries that outperformed their regional, their neighbours. They did better on a number of measures than countries around them, or in the case of Tamil Nadu, it was one of the best performing parts of India. Um, we used mixed methods, qualitative, quantitative interviews, focus groups, discussions, analysis of documents, lots of different ways of gathering data. And the things that we found that were important were capacity, having institutions, and particular institutions that persisted. If you change your civil service every year, you've got problems. So in a country like Kyrgyzstan that had several coups taking place during the last 20 years, but the same people remained in the government steering the health reform, despite violent revolutions, they persisted, they continued. Whereas there are other countries where every time there's a change of government, there's a complete clear out. And as we know, in the country to the south of you, they still have to fill about 90% of the posts that were vacated following the, uh, the uh, election of Donald Trump. Continuity is really important. Context, being able to, and then linked to context, being able to implement policies that actually take account of the context. Um, and windows of opportunity really are the, the key there. So that's what we find. Capacity, just to say it very, very briefly, leaders with vision and influence. Now, much of the study of history is about looking at great social trends, and it writes individuals out of the process. But time and again, you find individuals who actually made a difference. And they could even be people like unlikely ones, like Charles de Gaulle, who, when he was president uh, in the 19, late 1940s, pushed for the expansion of health insurance in France. And he was confronted by the leaders of the large industries, Dassault and uh, Peugeot and others, who said, we can't afford this. How can we possibly do this? And he simply said to them, look, when I was leading the Free French from London, you were collaborating with the Nazis. Don't tell me what's good for France. 
And uh, even though he was a right-wing um, prime minister, and, uh, uh, and we're, we're now seeing, I think, much of the same with Macron, with the very progressive health policies as well, coming in his case, admittedly, from the centre. Um, comprehensive programme, national strategy, people actually lobbying for health, a political commitment, support of politicians in other sectors, uh, street-level bureaucrats, multi-sectorality, stability of bureaucracies above all. Continuity is really key. People who can see things through over several different uh, electoral cycles or government cycles or even uh, uh, keeping things moving after coups. And the ability to take advantage of windows of opportunity. Political changes, the independence of Bangladesh. You see this all over. The introduction of national health services in Spain after the death of Franco, in Portugal after the overthrow of Salazar, and so on. Uh, the uh, transitions to democracy in Thailand, in, in, uh, Thai, in, in Taiwan, in Korea, in, the, uh, in South Korea. Many, many examples of this. Natural disasters. Even if we look at the National Health Service in England, um, the, um, uh, the Second World War. I should have said, of course, um, being where I am, I forgot one very prominent individual that we should never forget in all of this, and that is the greatest Canadian ever, Tommy Douglas from Saskatchewan, um, who, again, you all know. And um, that is an example of an individual who had a remarkable effect, and actually an effect, an impact which went well beyond Canada, because, of course, he's still uh, very much admired uh, in the rest of the world as well. Um, geopolitical interest in aid flows, Ethiopia has benefited particularly, Kyrgyzstan benefited. Kyrgyzstan was unusual during the uh, war in Afghanistan in having two air bases run by other air forces, one by the US Air Force and one by the Russian Air Force. Um, and so it traded off the two, it kept the two um, in competing to give it money and uh, seizing windows of opportunity. Making sure that policies are appropriate for context, they're evidence-based, um, they're linked to uh, economic strengthening, um, able to the ability to draw on resources from a wide range of, um, of sources. And resilience is absolutely key because many of these countries have gone through real crises and they've been able to keep things on um, on the road despite all of that. So what do we think in terms of all of that? What do we believe is, in the final slide, a successful health system? A country that has a vision and long-term strategies. It takes account its context. It takes account its starting condition. Do not try and put in place a complex financing system if you don't have a banking system in place because it's not going to work. Be, remember that some of the biggest challenges in creating health insurance are, um, are bringing in agricultural workers. Social insurance of the Bismarckian model um, that was introduced in Western Europe, that worked because you had trade unions and employers associations working together. If you don't have trade unions and employers associations, as you never had in Ireland or Greece, for example, two European countries that have struggled to implement universal health coverage, then you will not be able to bring in social insurance off the Bismarckian model. It just doesn't work. You need those other bits. A consensus, an agreement that healthcare, universal health coverage is a good idea. Another time we could talk about the way in which that is actively being eroded by certain powerful vested interests at the minute. And we could also talk about the way in which in the United States you actually have poor people out on the streets demonstrating against universal health care and ask, we could ask ourselves how that comes to be. But anyway, flexibility and autonomy, resilience, support from across government, synergies across sectors and a dialogue um, between public and private but with government oversight. So that's where we've got to in terms of trying to put together some sort of a measurement of the progress of nations. Nobody would pretend that the Health Access and Quality Index is perfect. It has all the limitations of the data that go into the global burden of disease. But the one big thing, and I was a skeptic, a great skeptic as Chris Murray and, and Alan Lopez know at the very beginning, there are two ways of dealing with inadequate data. One is to say they're useless, so we're not going to use them. The other is to say we're going to use them, and that way there'll be an impetus for them to get better. And there's still an awfully long way to go to both understand, I mean, we're only at the very beginning. Those graphs that I did showing uh, the US and Canada and Vietnam and Ethiopia, those have not been drawn before. I drew them in the plane coming over here. And they raise all sorts of questions. And there are many other pairwise comparisons where we can start to look at why countries that are ostensibly in some way similar 
um, are actually achieving very different results. And I think that that sets an agenda for research for all of us for the years ahead. So with that, thank you very much.